You know the movie Halloween, the one with Jamie Lee Curtis, where her character's brother Michael Myers kills his sister and ends up becoming a psycho killer who goes on a killing rampage whenever he manages to escape from the facility where he's being held. It takes place in a small town in Illinois called Haddonfield. Well, what if I told you that the town of Haddonfield was based on the town I live in, and the story is more real than most people know? Lori, who is Michael's younger sister, ends up being adopted by the Strode family. This is a real family who live in my town. They own a furniture store in the downtown square. Back in 1963, when Michael Myers kicked the whole thing off by killing his older sister, who was supposed to be babysitting while their parents were out for the night, Haddonfield, as we'll continue to call it, for sake of anonymity, was a very small farming town 50-some miles from Chicago. The Strode family had a couple generations of rooted history in the area, and Morgan, Laurie's adoptive father, was a realtor in town for many years. His brother, James, owned a furniture store in town, the same one that his son, Mark, still runs, to this day. On that evening of Halloween in 1963 in the town of Haddonfield, Michael Myers, an alias that John Carpenter used for sake of anonymity, did indeed kill his sister by stabbing her several times with a large kitchen knife. That's the end of the similarities between the movie and the real-life story. See, Michael didn't just stop there. When his parents arrived home to find their oldest daughter dead, Michael was not standing in front of the house. Instead, he was hiding under his little sister's toddler-sized bed. When his mother ran into the room to check on little Laurie, Michael slashed at her ankles and then cut her throat after she fell. Meanwhile, his father was downstairs on the phone with the police, not knowing what was about to happen to himself. As a six-year-old Michael rounded the corner into the kitchen, his father was looking out the back window with the phone in his hand as the knife plunged into his side, puncturing one of his lungs and preventing him from speaking or making any noise. When the police arrived, they found Michael standing over his little sister in her bed, staring blankly at her with the bloody knife still clutched in his little fist. The officers that were on the scene that night all had to go through years of therapy and never truly got over what they saw that night. None of them could explain in enough detail during the trial, as they all were in shock and pretty much blocked out many of the gruesome details of what they had seen. Morgan Strode and his wife, Pamela, were called the following day to come pick up little Lori from the police station, where she was held for the night by one of the dispatch workers as she slept soundly, having no idea what happened to her family. The Strodes didn't have much red tape to go through to adopt Lori, as there was no other family the state was able to track down. Apparently, the Myers family was on its last legs, and after Michael's murderous rampage, there was no chance for the family's survival. Once Lori was out of high school, it is unclear what happened to her, as she went away to college and never returned home, although the Strodes insist to this day that she is still alive and well, just staying out of the public eye. She knows her story, even though it was told by Carpenter as a fictional horror without giving based on real events credit. Only those who grew up in Haddonfield know the real story about our little town, as well as who the Myers family really is. But Laurie Strode and the rest of the Strode family are 100% real. I'm not sure why Carpenter decided to give aliases to the town and the Myers family, but not the Strode's family or Laurie, for that matter. Either way, there are no records of Laurie prior to the incident that fateful Halloween night, and that may be the only other piece of the puzzle that fits into the movie, but otherwise, there's no way to trace back and find the real Myers family unless you can talk it out of one of us Haddonfield residents. Legend has it that Michael grew up at the Elgin Mental Health Center where he was kept up until he escaped in 1978, when he supposedly came home to attack Laurie, according to the movie plot. In reality, he was determined to be untreatable by the age of 21 and was moved to a secured facility where they had better lockdown measures for the mentally insane somewhere south of Haddonfield potentially Joliet Prison. Yeah, that one. The real question is, if Joliet is no longer a working facility, where is he being kept now? From what I've been able to gather, based on tracking him by his real name, there's a potential of him being checked in at Joliet, but they have no record of him being treated there. Given that when Joliet closed, all the existing inmates were sent to Stateville, there's no record of Myers ever going through intake there. Although, there's also no record of him being transferred out of Joliet. He's not on the list with all the other prisoners who were moved. Local rumor mill has him still locked up somewhere deep within the Joliet facility, 
although there's no evidence showing that to be true. There's also rumor that during the closing transfers, somehow a small group of prisoners was lost track of, and the authorities wiped their records to avoid any problems. Again, really hard to prove with no records to go off of. For all we know, they lost Myers so they wouldn't be held accountable for killing him off or something. There's a lot of hearsay and rumors, but nothing that's traceable, even if you know his real name. All I know is the potential of someone that psychotic being out there is truly disturbing. The O'Brien family had spent Halloween 1974 at a friend's home in Pasadena, where Ronald O'Brien volunteered to escort the children on their candy collecting rounds. The children were going house to house until they reached one darkened home, where someone who only opened the door, a crack, had handed them five pixie sticks. After returning to their home in Deer Park, O'Brien told his son Timothy he could choose a single piece of candy before bedtime. The boy gulped down a mouthful of the powder, then went to bed after complaining that it tasted bitter. Minutes later, Timothy ran to the bathroom and began vomiting. By the time he got to the hospital, he was dead. Initially, his father was of little help to investigators. Accompanying police as they searched the Pasadena neighborhood, the 30-year-old father was unable to remember any details of the house where he got the poisoned candy or the person who gave it to him. The father's story abruptly changed on his third trip with officers through the neighborhood. Detectives said he suddenly remembered the suspect was a white man and pointed out the home. However, investigators quickly cleared the homeowner. A few days after Timothy was buried, an insurance agent had called police to report that, unknown to his wife, the father had taken out policies on his two children shortly before Halloween. Detectives also learned that the father was deep in debt, had been boasting to co-workers at Texas State Optical that his financial health soon would undergo a remarkable recovery. The father also quizzed one of his customers, a chemist, about poisons. He seemed particularly curious about potassium cyanide and asked where it could be purchased, the customer told police. Investigators later scoured the family home where they found the father's pocket knife with traces of plastic and powdered candy stuck to the blade. The eight-year-old Deer Park boy died October 31, 1974, after eating trick-or-treat candy laced with cyanide. Within days, his father, Ronald Clark O'Brien, stood accused of staging the crime as part of a life insurance scheme. With his wife testifying for the prosecution, O'Brien was convicted and sentenced to death. Dubbed the Candy Man by fellow prisoners, he was executed by lethal injection in 1984. Halloween has lived on, but not the way it was. Back when I was in high school, me and my best friend would basically hang out at school together because her dad was the warden of the local prison and his house wasn't even a half a mile from it. Her mum was judgmental and, well, a bit hostile. It was the attitude more than anything that kept me from hanging out over at her house. She was a woman you didn't mess with. One day, my friend said her mother came home white as a ghost the night before because when she and her friends had come out of the grocery store, halfway to her car, they stopped and noticed someone in the back seat. She was thinking it was my friend, her daughter, but as she stepped closer, she saw that it was an elderly woman. Well, she started to go to the car, but her friend stopped her and said that she probably got off the bus from the assistant living center and she had better call the police and let them handle it. Well, she did, and police got there within minutes because they were practically around the block. The police car pulled up and she pointed to her car. The officer walked up to the window and she watched as the officer snatched the door open and literally yanked the old woman out and pushed her against the car and frisked her. My friend's mom was horrified until the officer snatched the wig off the man's head. She was frantic now, because if it hadn't been for her friends, she would have gotten in and offered her a ride home. So always remember to check your back seat 